everyone. Welcome back to New Comic Book Late Night Live. I'm your host, Captain Logan, and here comes the Curious Lo. Hello. Lo is coming. She's here. <laughs> oh, hold on. I got to go find the Curious there she is. She's here. Uh, so we were not able to make it last week, unfortunately. Um, I we it was so weird. We did a live show that evening on E3, and then I immediately proceeded to get really sick and wasn't able to do another live show that night. It was really strange. And uh, so we're back again tonight, and Lone and I are going to start with our books from this last week, and then a little bit later in the show, we'll run down some books from the previous week uh, just to... Um, just to hit some things that maybe we would have wanted to talk about last week. Uh, so thanks a lot for being here, folks. Good to see you if you are here live. And uh, as always, we'll have a little Q&A at the end. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just jump right into it. And, uh, well, I'm going to let you start tonight. Uh, why don't you, as we always do, jump right into it with your third favorite comic book from this last week. All right. We're just getting right into it. So my Get right into third it. Let's favorite do the thing. is Black Road number three. Um, I featured the first issue a couple weeks back. It was pretty early on in the show. Um, I love the art style. I've mentioned that before. Um, I didn't talk about issue number two, really. Um, it was a little bit uh, boring. But this issue, some <laughs> things picked up again. We have our characters learning about um, the city that they are going toward, um, that they're traveling towards on the Black Road. There was also a pretty awesome fight against a bunch of wolves, which you can sort of see depicted here on the cover. She's hiding behind a tree and there's a scary wolf. And this art style, I don't know, I really like it. Um, it's right at my alley. It's very like, it's very fantasy. And even though so far there's not really any magic or anything, but it's a uh, very like Viking kind of feel to it, um, which I don't know, always seems like fantasy, even if it's not to me. <laughs> uh, so overall, pretty fun issue. I'm still really digging this title, and I'm looking forward to what's coming out for it next. Awesome. What fantastic. about you? I should, I should mention real quick before I get into, into my number three that uh, we already had somebody who, at the beginning of the show, uh, guessed something that we would uh, say was one of our most anticipated books for this week, and that was Red Letter and Tilly. So congratulations to you, sir. And I will reveal what that book is a little bit later on. Uh, but uh, you will get one of my Marvel books this week. Good job. Make sure I get a note about that. I will send you the code. Uh, this week, I think maybe the first time I've put this particular book on my uh, top three. I've talked about it before, but uh, this time I had to go with Back to the Future number nine. Uh, this is a series that has not been super impressive to me. I've been a little bit let down with it, and uh, I had to pick this partly just on principle of low number nine. Finally, we're time traveling! Yay! <laughs> we're going somewhere! In a thing called Back to the Future, uh, we, we we actually go to the future and we go to uh, 2035. So uh, we go beyond 2015 for the first time. Back to the Future. That's kind of fun. And uh, Griff is involved in this. Um, it's kind of interesting because we know that, uh, from you know the the, the trilogy uh, from Back in, from the end of Back to the Future three that 2015 doesn't necessarily work out exactly the, and obviously can't work out exactly the same way that it did at the beginning of that movie because Marty McFly has been through his character arc and he's not going to make the same mistakes that led to um, the stuff that happened to him in that movie and so um, the, with Butterfly Effect that future could have looked entirely different and I will say that the future in this does is extrapolated some from that um, and uh, there's kind of there's kind of a fun and, and there's a lot of fun detail and I like how that's done um, I, I think it I think it works but there is this um there's this fun moment where uh, they're, they're, they land uh, in a roller rink, uh, basically, and uh, it's, it's this hoverboard roller rink, and Marty says something about hoverboards, and somebody's like, hoverboards? Who says that anymore? What are you, my grandfather? And I thought that was really funny. Um, it, it, they, they, uh, they go back to the, they go to the future, like I said, far, farther into the future, with a time hot air balloon. And this is one of those, yeah, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Uh, they basically do time travel the way Men in Black 3 does it, where you uh, drop really fast toward the ground and then you hit enough of a speed and you're able to go, so we go 88 miles an hour going vertically to the, to the ground and then we pull a parachute when we get into the future. That sounds way more dangerous than a DeLorean. Yeah. And 
a lot of the time in this book, uh, I tend to get irritated when we bank too much on uh, iconography and lines of dialogue from those movies. But this is one where I thought it was kind of fun, where we go back to the uh, the Lone Pine Mall, and now it's the Lone Pine Mall. Um, of course, we, we, it has to be there. And uh, Marty says, uh, Doc, you mean to tell me you made a time machine out of a hot air balloon? And I thought that was, was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> So when they go to the future from the Lone Pine Mall, they they find themselves in this giant like like uh, uh, Lone Pine like like uh like Astrodome <laughs> looking looking place where it's this huge sports arena that was built on that site. And I, I thought that was really fun. Uh, social some of the social commentary is really cool. Um, I like the playing with futuristic language and how uh our our like social media language has um influenced the future. We see that a lot in futuristic things right now. Uh, but this kind of plays it tongue in cheek and and uh, and makes some fun uh jokes and gags out of it. Uh, which which uh, which I enjoyed a lot, and um, I'm still liking Marty, Marty's character arc about um, his obsession with adventure and missing this life of time traveling, and then here already starting to realize that um, maybe the whole thing is. Uh, but I guess this is a lesson that they sort of learned before, so it could end up looking like regressing. Regressing, but um, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm. I'm uh, waiting to see before I judge it too much until it's over. Uh, but he he has this kind of um, this kind of attitude by the end of this particular issue of oh wait uh, maybe we're being a little bit too irresponsible and it's not worth my obsession with adventure and feeling like the fun of my life is behind me. Um, but uh, this is this is exactly what I had been hoping this book would turn into and um, this is a really good starting place. Uh, I would say just jump right into in, into this book if you want to see actual time travel in Back to the Future. Uh, go ahead, Lo. <laughs> All right, my number two is Wonder Woman number one, the new Rebirth title, which is the start of one of the two arcs that are happening in this book, which is yeah. weird to it. me. You I did. I, I didn't know till today, and I forgot to put it on my pull list, so I missed it. It's the I start knew I missed something. Two. Is that normal? Like, I haven't seen that, to have two separate story arcs doing every other... Like yeah, no, no, it, no, it's pretty, it's pretty unusual. Um, okay. the, the only thing I can think of that is kind of akin to it, which is interesting because uh, it's it's another mythology thing, is Jason Aaron sort of did it with the beginning of his Thor run, but then the uh, different time periods he was playing with were were um subplots that culminated into something later on, and I don't know if that's going to happen with this or not. It could because of how Rebirth happened and how it's two universes colliding, but um. But yeah, I liked it a lot. Um, it's the start of the subplot Lies, as opposed to Wonder Woman Earth, is it year one? Um, that's happening starting two weeks from now. And that's part of, I think, why they can get away with this, is that since it's every other week, they can do two different, because it's almost like you're reading two titles that are once monthly. Um, but it's pretty standard setup stuff. We've got Diana alone in the middle of, like, the woods, she's checking out some like werewolf creatures. I don't even know um, because I've never read literally anything Wonder Woman except for Wonder Woman Rebirth number one. So I'm all very new to her mythology and everything that's back behind her. But I was interested, um, it didn't really give us a lot of answers, but it had a lot of cool, I don't know, uh, set up stuff that I'm intrigued by. I'm excited to see where this goes in two issues. Next time we'll be seeing the start of the other arc. Yeah, I've been real intrigued by that idea, uh, and and it's smart with the double shipping thing because Steve and I had a conversation about this earlier this evening. Um, we already are starting to see what looks like maybe a little bit of padding and stories uh, taking longer to tell than they probably would if we weren't double shipping. We're not nearly enough stories happening in an issue. Um, I felt that way about Superman from a couple weeks ago. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, but like the, the first, there's some cool two-page spreads and stuff, but the whole first seven, eight, nine pages could have easily been done in one or two. Um, and so with what Ruck is doing with Wonder Woman, uh, it's really nice that he's basically writing two different comic books at one time because he, first of all, it's Rucka, so he won't do that probably, but also, um, you know, he's telling two comic books simultaneously, so there would be no reason to stretch like that. Um, so yeah, that's very exciting, and I'm bummed that I missed that, and I'll have to hurry up and grab it, uh, and, and um, you know, get that ordered. 
All right, what about you? What's your number two? Uh, my number two, and I'm a little bit surprised by this, is uh, the Flash number one. Uh, the, of, of course, in our our new relaunch rebirth, um, I this this issue resonated with me a whole bunch. Um, this is basically it's a really nice kind of character study for Barry Allen, um, getting back to the basics with this character and dealing with how difficult it is for him being a speedster. And for his job, along with being a superhero, to all be about getting justice for people, to not stretch himself too thin and not accomplish anything very well. Uh, it's that kind of jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none of thing. And there's, there's a place where... Um, where uh, I think I forget who it is. If it's I think it's Iris. Um, someone close to him. I, I suggest this to him, and he's the Flash. He's constantly moving and never stopping, and he's never stopped to think about this. And it's kind of an obvious thing. And it and and he goes, "Oh yeah, you're right. Uh, I'm constantly um, trying to do everything at once, and maybe I'm not really." Uh, accomplishing, you, you know, enough of anything. Uh, but of course, he's got this kind of savior complex. And because he can move so fast, he feels like he ought to be able to uh, fix everything and stop every crime. And of course, he knows that's impossible. And yet he's so fast. It, it, it is it, like, like, sometimes it feels like he could, he could do everything. Um, and I don't know, I being being me and being someone that has a tendency to stretch myself too thin sometimes, this this issue resonated with me a lot. Um, I'm the art in this is starting to to uh, grab me. I'm starting to turn around on it. I didn't really care for it with the rebirth issue, but I thought it fit this material really well. Uh, this kind of this kind of sketchy, really pencily uh, artwork, and um, I'm not sure how I feel about the. Uh, about the big reveal at the end, uh, the cliffhanger with this, just because it feels like really typical, kind of been there, done that Flash kind of stuff, but it might get really interesting. Um, it just seems like it's going to be another Flash story that deals with a lot of different speedsters, and of course, you know, that we've done that a lot with Flash. And it does feel like a book that is strategically trying to be a good jumping on point for people who only know the TV show. Uh, Jitters is mentioned in this, and I don't know if that's been a thing that's been around a lot. <clears throat> Honestly, I don't know if that's just a TV show thing or if that's already a Flash comic book thing, because I'm not a giant Flash guy, so I might be responding to some things that the TV show did not invent that were already comic book things. I don't know. Uh, but there were a few things here and there where I was like, oh, it's trying to make sure that that uh, Flash TV fans can jump on this. Uh, I thought there was a, maybe a little bit too much recap at the beginning. Um, because the Flashpoint stuff doesn't really factor, Flashpoint, excuse me, the, the Rebirth stuff doesn't really factor into this too much. Uh, there's there's some recap at the beginning where he's like, me and Batman have been working on figuring out uh, what happened with those 10 years that we lost, and we think we're on to something. I'm not going to tell you what it is right now or really talk about it much because we, we, we're, not, we're not ready to tell anybody about it. So in my narration to the audience, I'm also not going to talk about it, even though it's internal monologue, and I totally could. So, um, so, that's, so that's a little bit of, um, I, I think, kind of extraneous setup, but it's a lot more uh, like character building and, and uh, kind, of, kind of fleshing out who Barry is, and uh, there's a lot more. It, it took longer to read than these than a lot of these have lately. Um, so it's it's kind of the polar opposite of this, where I felt like there definitely was plenty of story that was told in that first issue. Um, but yeah, I like that quite a bit, and I'm not a big Flash guy. Uh, I don't know if I'll stay on that book just because I'm not a big Flash guy, but um, but I, I thought that was quite good. Yeah, I I didn't pick up Flash. I sort of I get so many books already, and I did drop a few to make room for Rebirth, but. I couldn't like, you know, drop five books and then start reading 10. Um, so I think I dropped five and I ended up picking five Rebirth. And unfortunately, Flash wasn't one of them. Who knows if if it keeps getting, because I've seen most people say it's really awesome. So if it keeps getting like fairly decent reviews, I might switch it out for something else. We'll see. Uh, I should but probably yeah, I also, that's Joshua Williamson and I usually like him. Mm. That makes sense then. <laughs> yeah, no, All right. I, just, I meant to mention forgot sorry yeah sorry. all right i'm gonna go ahead and go on to my number one which i don't think will really surprise anyone it's gwenpool number what is this three gwenpool number oh three. my god that issue it's so good yeah it was amazing um i love and i was sort of apprehensive that they would do something like this but i kind of like what they did with it um with showing 
I don't want to call it our world, but you know, the real world, the world that she came from, where comic books are comic books and she knows all these characters from them. Um, we had sort of discussed this, that it was sort of like a, a cool thing about her character that she would know all of these like secret identities and quirks of all these different characters. But I think they did a really good job with it being um, Doctor Strange that <laughs> yeah. came in. And I love the little quip about Benedict Cumberbatch. Like they, they did a little, a little bit about kind of some stuff that's happening in our world, but it was just one little line. And then they moved on to uh, like showing some stuff about Gwen that I think is pretty exciting and telling. I mean, she, she had him pull some of her existence out of her world and into this comic book world. She made the decision to potentially have her parents forget about her, which is crazy. Um, that shows that she has a pretty troubled history um, that she, it seems like she probably feels pretty guilty for something that she did in her world, which is cool. Um, because I didn't expect to really care about her past. I was more just along for this like fun, quirky ride of this like cool girl, just knowing about comic books and running around inside the comic books. Um, but there's more to it than that. And every issue has kept showing me that there is more to it than just this sort of, I'm going to run them around in a comic book world and and kill people and it won't matter because it's comic books like but it, it's starting to matter and it's starting to be this really interesting plot that i'm super enjoying um uh, i could go on and on about this issue i'm not gonna i'll say a couple of things i did not put this on my top three this week uh but i i maybe i ought to have it was definitely <laughs> it was definitely in there it was definitely in my top four um low th this is this is some of the the smarter metafiction that I've read in a while. And of course, comics, we do this kind of metafiction stuff all the time, where we like to comment on the publication uh, as much as anything else in our, our real world. Um, I can't believe how well this balances, and, and I, I've praised this before, but this one, this issue especially. Um, if I had just, I'm pretty sure if I had just jumped in with this, I would have been absolutely blown away by this issue, uh, regardless of the rest of it. The, and I think it's a decent okay. Like, if you haven't read the first two issues, you could still probably read this and be okay. Um, um, but uh, I mean, like, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing this one pretty hard. I, I like, like, if, if you think this is another just like silly, quirky, uh, uh, kind of goofy throwaway book, it's, it's not. There's some thinking here. Um, the balance between the drama and the absurd kooky stuff is really sophisticated. Um, I'll use that word. I like. I'm, I'm impressed by how it still feels like it's in the Marvel Universe proper, where everybody isn't... Well, okay. I was going to say everybody's not like like talking like they're in a quirky comic book all of a sudden when they wouldn't usually. Um, I think Doctor Strange seems slightly out of character um, here and there, but it's, it's it maybe kind of just a different... Because they're... I don't know. I've seen different people write him different ways. And I also haven't been reading that book. So I like, I read the first issue, but this might be more in line with, um, with the way Jason Aaron is doing that character than I'm aware of. I don't know. Uh, she gets literally fictionalized. That's such a cool idea. And it, like, like she, she doesn't, she's a real person who's stuck in a comic book world and needs to have a bank account and stuff. And it, it isn't on the books anywhere because she doesn't actually exist. And in order to actually exist, uh, she has to kind of give up some of herself from the real world. And we find out that kind of part of the reason she's here is to run away. And we have made the comic book literally escapist. Really, really cool. There, there's some yeah. wonderful meta stuff. Um, I could, I could write, I could write a paper on this. There's a lot of cool stuff going on there um, that I won't get into. But yeah, I should have put that on my list because it's wonderful. <laughs> That's okay. I had it on my list, and I'm sure you knew that I would have it on my list. So we That's got part of why I didn't. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. That's part of why I didn't. Uh, my number one this week is another thing that uh, I, I'm surprised by, and I seriously expected to drop this book after this issue and i really liked it and i guess i'm going to continue on it uh, this is detective comics number 935 continuing to build this really unlikely bat team with batwoman leading uh kind of an army of uh batman characters and i think it's important to note that uh you know she's uh ex-military and really leading uh this team like a military team uh really kind of fleshing out a, a lot of these uh, characters quite a bit, but uh, honestly, I mostly put this on my list just because of how much fun 
this was and for very panel layouts um i i, I really i really enjoyed uh, how creative um Tinian and Barrows are here with uh where they put panels and um with how cinematic and uh and and fun and over the top this feels while also being kind of a grounded book all at the same time um it feels like it ought to be a, a kind of an adult smart animated series um that's that's kind of how it reads to me uh something i was really impressed with is uh you, you turn a page and you get a, a page that's mostly just action, hardly any dialogue. And one of the panels is a bat symbol. And I just thought that was fantastic. That was so cool. Uh, so a lot of style and character in this book. And I really liked that. Uh, I wanted to mention, and I'll talk a little bit about Batman number one uh, here in a little bit, because we didn't get to talk about that last week. But um, I want to mention the new Batmobile, because uh, consistently we're using it between both books, which I was a little bit surprised by. I kind of thought maybe each book would have its own Batmobile. Also, I should mention Batman is factoring into this book a lot more than I thought he would. Um, he suddenly feels like uh, one of the main protagonists, and it's not just uh, a, in, in, uh, an offbeat bat team. But, um, okay, so this new Batmobile, is the uh, Batman animated series Batmobile with the old 50s car bat face just stuck on the front of it, uh, which I think is kind of hilarious. Um, I love the animated Batmobile kind of kind of coming back and making a making a big comeback. Um, but I can't decide what I think about putting that bat face right on the front of it. Uh, but yeah, uh, the way that Clayface is factoring into this is instantly interesting. Uh, and dealing with his identity stuff, and also um, just uh, again from a style uh, uh, place, I should mention how neat it is that their bat cave is called the Belfry and looks like this. I just think that's super cool. Um, that that has the potential to be the new clock tower and be a thing that everybody wants to do after this. I think it's neat. Uh, really surprised by how it mostly just a really entertaining book. I think this has a lot of potential for uh, really fun, interesting character things and dynamics between, between characters and relationships, but just so much style and class with this book. I'm really impressed with it. Didn't think I would want to read a bat team book. Kind of digging on, digging on that. Nice. All right. Well, should we move on to other books? Let's move on to other books, Flo. Yeah. Uh, tell us about All some right. other things that you read from this last week. Should I do just this last week or the previous week as well? Lump it um, all together. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead. That's, that's Lump totally it? Cool. All right. Just the only other together. thing the only other thing I had from this week was Doctor Strange, which I did not get to. So <laughs> I have nothing to say about it, which is part of the reason why I want to mention my books from the previous week. Um, so we had the next Spider-Gwen, which uh, dealt with a lot of the ramifications of the Spider-Woman crossover. As you guys know, I loved that crossover. I like what they're doing with Gwen. Um, I think it's an interesting place to put her character and uh, really have her examine why she wants to be Spider-Woman and uh, what that means for her personal life and how she feels about herself. It's a very like introspective uh, issue. So I liked that about her. We had Scooby Apocalypse number two, which is still just really, really fun. I'm super digging this book. If you love Scooby-Doo and also like dystopias, this is a really good mashing of those two. Um, the characters are drawn very different than anything I've seen. I mentioned the first issue when it came out as well, and this is doing an amazing job of continuing that story. It's super fun. And then Han Solo number one, I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. It seemed pretty generic to me. Um, it's really just sort of a setup. I'm intrigued by this idea of like entering a race as like a super secret like mission run. Um, it's very uh, it's very speed racer. So we'll see. But the first issue didn't super grab me, but it's Star Wars, so I'll probably continue with it anyway. And I read Superman, Green Arrow, and Batman Rebirth, and I quite enjoyed all of them. I don't want to say too much. One more thing. I had the final issue of The Tomorrows, which has been delayed like crazy. I mean, this is issue six, and the first issue, or like the, the issue before that came out in like January. Like it's been forever since we've seen an issue of this, and they just delayed the last issue forever. But it's out, and I quite enjoyed the end. Um, it's a really fun mini series. It's kind of dark, but... Pretty fun and futuristic, if you're into that sort of thing. All right, Cap, <laughs> what about you? Uh, before I go on to my books from my other books, and I'll try not to talk too long, I'll, I'll be real brief on these. Uh, but I should mention, because I'm seeing a lot of things in the comments uh, about Detective Comics, about like 
uh, be, be, characterizations that are inconsistent and stuff. Um, I should mention that I don't know what the deal with Tim Drake has been through all of 52, so I don't know if the way he's utilized in this makes any sense or not with his reinvention. Uh, I didn't like his reinvention, so I didn't pay any attention to it. Uh, a lot of people saying things like he shouldn't be trained by Batwoman because he's um, cause, you know he's Tim Drake and he was trained by Lady Shiva and he, he, he knows all that stuff already. Um, it's played a little bit more like he's kind of her right hand, like Batman put her in charge uh, but there is there's a lot of discussion between the two of them about how this team should be put together and everything. So I don't feel like that's exactly what's going on, but I hear what people are saying about it. Um, but as far as just the rest of these characters with 52 and stuff, um, you know, you got the 10 year gap thing and uh, part of the point of rebirth is that a lot of that is stupid and we're trying to rectify it. So I don't know. I don't want to hold that against this book. Um, I, I enjoyed the what we have of the story so far, and um, like I said, the style of that book. Uh, let me move on now to uh, Be Bob and Rocksteady Destroy Everything three and four because this is a weekly book for five weeks. I feel like it's a, it's only a five issue miniseries, and I guess it's weekly because the only thing I can figure is that uh, there's a lot of really bizarre, silly, convoluted time travel, and maybe you won't remember what's going on month to month, so we just put it out once a week. Uh, but I'm glad that we're getting it that way because it's so entertaining and so much fun, and I, the, only, the only thing that sucks is, you know, uh, once it's over, it's over. Uh, I will probably do a full-blown review on this uh, after it's over. It is, it is just super ridiculous, over-the-top fun. And yet, the time travel is a lot more consistent and makes sense than a lot of other time travel things going on right now. Uh, if this was what Legends of Tomorrow is, I think people would like that show a lot more. Um, it, it's, I mean, it's really goofy and out there, uh, but I always trust it. Like as far as the time travel goes and stuff, it's clearly we're thinking, and it's just so much more. I, I mean, I, maybe it's not fair to compare these things, but it's 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 so much more fun and lively, and um, being really creative with all of the uh, weirdness with all of that. We've got um, multiple Bebop and Rocksteadies running around the multiverse right now in different time periods, and it's hilarious. Uh, at the beginning of the fourth issue, um, the uh, two Bebops and two Rocksteadies have gotten together and uh, decided that they hate their respective uh, Bebop or Rocksteady counterparts. And so one Bebop, one mutated Bebop goes off with a human Bebop, and a mutated Rocksteady goes off with a human Rocksteady. And the discussions they have with each other as kind of different people but the same are absolutely hilarious. Uh, so much mileage in this book with how they're idiots, but they have very much their own unique voices and and uh, points of view even still and they land on really clever lines of dialogue and banter and stuff uh that you wouldn't land on if you weren't that dumb and i just <laughs> love that about it uh there's there's this there's this bit where the two bebops are sitting in a bar and one of them said in a futuristic bar and one of them says um uh you're um I'm trying to remember what it was. Sorry, I got I got distracted because I was also thinking about the fact that there's a Utram there that you know the you know the brain guys that has that has like a big crank suit and one of the Bebops just starts talking to the head and doesn't realize that the brain is actually in charge and that was really funny. But anyway, um, what one of them one of them is like, uh, yeah, we don't need Rocksteady anymore. Uh, we'll be Bebop and, Re and Bebop. And then the other one says that has a nice ring to it. And then after that, the first Bebop says, yes, they rhyme. <laughs> I, I, just, I love that book. It's wonderful. Um, Carnage number nine, I'm still bored. Uh, the cover is great, but I just don't care about anything that's going on in this book. Um, it, it has taken far too long to get where we're at, and I don't even like this story. So anyway, uh, moving on. X-Files number three. Um, I need to just read this in trade because I can't remember what happened last month, and I was really riveted by that issue, but I read this whole issue, and I don't re even remember right now what happened in it. So I need I need to just be reading this all together. Um, it's still uh, really, really creepy and wonderfully authentic to X-Files. Um, it's even though we've gotten, we're, we're not doing uh, nine to ten anymore, and we're still, and, and we've, um, and we've moved on to the current X Files continuity. Uh, it still has the same flavor of that stuff, and um, it's, it's quite good. Uh, Action Comics nine fifty eight. Uh, I had a, I had a conversation with Steve about this earlier, and I liked it less after I talked to Steve about it. Um, 
we're, we're maybe not, he's right in that we're maybe not getting enough done in this book, uh, issue to issue so far. Uh, I still enjoyed the crap out of it. Um, wonderfully dynamic action, uh, really cinematic looking stuff. It's, but it is Jurgen's um, kind of reliving his glory days a little bit, I think, where uh, he's getting to go back to the 90s and do all the Death of Superman stuff, and um, I hope he gets it out of his system and we move on and start really telling some stories. Uh, we just don't get far enough in the story with this. Like, like Doomsday is back for some reason, and we have a Clark Kent that is not Superman, or I don't even remember, I don't even think he comes out and says whether or not he is Superman. Um, it's just this Clark Kent, where did he come from? We don't know who he is, and there's some really stereotypically like shady guy who's behind everything like evil machinations looking at a big thing of monitors uh that's behind everything you gotta have that and we we didn't we didn't make any headway at all with that it's basically just a big slugfest but a really fun wonderful wonderful to read slugfest uh and then some stuff from the previous week and of course i just put all my new books on top of my old books. <laughs> uh, Ninja Turtles 59 continues to be the best book on the stands. People should be reading that. Uh, there is We're finally getting back to the, the whole Splinter leading the Foot Clan thing and dealing with more of the mysticism, and uh, it looks like the other shoe is about to drop with that. There is, there is kind of a looming feeling that Shredder's uh, spirit might come back a lot earlier than I would have expected, and I might have enjoyed telling some more stories before we get back to Shredder already, but I'm not sure if that's exactly what's going to happen yet either, so um, who knows? I don't want to criticize it for that too much yet, uh, but um, this was wonderful and kind of kind of creepy and disturbing in places, um, or at least as disturbing as that book gets, and then uh, Superman number one, as I said earlier, just not, just like with Action Comics, just not getting enough done uh, in the issue. My beef with this is that I think it's technically maybe a, a better issue than uh, than the previous action. Although I liked that that more, but it's just it's it's more it's more of a character piece. The problem is it's contradicting stuff in that book. So we're not uh, between between Jurgens and Tomasi. We're not uh, really talking between these books enough. Uh, they don't seem to be planning these together well enough, and that's kind of problematic to me. For instance, uh, in, in that first issue of Action, uh, Superman has a really specific reason to uh, put on his old costume and fly off, and here, uh, it looks like he's about to do that apart from that scene, like it's an alternate universe. And it's really weird, and I don't know what's going on. Um, we're having a really difficult time, both Jurgens and Tomasi, uh, deciding how exactly to write Superman's son. That's that's a beef I've got with both of these right now, uh, where he gets to really typical melodramatic places too quickly. I get that he's a kid and that kids sometimes have emotional outbursts and stuff, but it just it reads like the really typical uh, sometimes cringeworthy way of doing that, and that's problematic. Um, but the way we're introducing the Justice League uh, to the Superman is is really interesting and cool. And this uh, kid learning uh, about his powers and um, the in dealing with uh, the repercussions of uh, of using them and not understanding them yet is quite is quite good and uh, pretty gripping. Um, Darnay returns Last Crusade. Uh, I wish. We had, we had done our show last week. I would have talked quite a bit about this, um, but again, I'll keep this brief. Um, I love this at the beginning and it did, didn't at the end. Uh, it's kind of weird. Um, this is, Eric and I are in agreement on this. He and I talked about this book. Uh, we both think that by the time you get to the, the end of this book, first of all, it kind of just ends and doesn't really feel like, uh, and feels like a great beginning to something, but not really a good you know, one shot all its own. Um, I don't really know why we needed this. Uh, I, sp I especially don't know why it needed to be in the Dark Knight Returns continuity. Uh, it, it really feels like, because it doesn't feel like that. Batman, he's not about the same things. And uh, with, with the whole Jason Todd thing, it really feels like just a Jason Todd interlude, like before the Jason Todd death thing happens where uh, Batman is, is um, trying to come to terms with... Uh, training a kid and the ethics of that and uh like like the whole world is suddenly turning against batman for using a teenager 
And that angle was kind of interesting and, and was the thing that felt most Dark Knight Returnish about it. Um, but it felt like a thing that just as easily could have happened in the regular continuity. And, um, and, and you know, it, it, Batman dealing with uh, the fact that Jason Todd, you know, uh, goes too far, he's too brutal, and he's blaming himself for that a little bit. I do like this conversation that he has with Alfred. Again, this could have been any version of Batman, I think. But I, I like this conversation he has with Alfred um, about the kind of personality traits that he should be looking for in a partner and uh, that maybe he should be looking um, more for his for for his own um, like like uh, like ethics and um, and heart and stuff as opposed to uh, this kind of drive uh, Green Lantern's number one don't usually read Green Lantern but it's got red lanterns and I love those uh, this is pretty. This is a pretty good first issue. Pretty good introduction to this series. I thought. I don't know these two Green Lanterns that are kind of Green Lantern misfits that nobody's taking seriously. I thought they were interesting, and uh, I like the art in this uh, quite a bit. It's pretty good. It's, it's kind of your typical uh, Green Lantern art, and um, the Red Lanterns are back, and that's exciting to me. Um, I don't have anything else to say about it, but I will keep on this um, for at least as long as the Red Lanterns are there. <laughs> Um, oh man, there's just so much stuff, isn't there? Uh, Civil War II, I know, I'm not I didn't even, even go over, like, half of my books. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's just, I've got a lot, and there, I had some major <laughs> No, stuff. no, go like, for last it. Last week would have been a really big show, and, uh, anyway, Civil War II, I don't know, verdict's out on this for me. Um, I can't decide if characters are out of character, specifically with Iron Man and Captain Marvel, or if Bendis is trying too hard to make this book fun and jokey in the midst of the really heavy stuff. I think a lot of that is kind of forced. I feel like the whole situation is kind of forced. Uh, I feel like characters are acting far more extreme about this kind of kind of pre-crime idea. Uh, you've got an inhuman that can read the future and should we act on that or, or should we or should we not? Um, I think that's an interesting ethical conundrum. I feel like it's become a war too quickly and too easily and like we've just forced that to make the premise of this book work. Um, I don't hate it but it does but it does feel kind of forced. Um, and then Batman number one. Uh, this is this is an issue that I wasn't in love with, wasn't gripped with, thought it was just an okay um, introduction at first, and then I read it a second time, and I liked it a whole lot more. Um, the situation here is basically Batman uh, being put in a traditional Superman situation, and, and, and a really easy, normal situation that Superman is always able to solve. There's an airplane that's going to crash, and he's got to catch it. And... In, in this case, uh, there are no superheroes with any kind of powers around, so what's he going to do? And um, he comes up with a way to solve this, but he would die uh, uh, if, if, um, if something didn't happen that intervened. Um, spoiler alert, Batman does not die in this issue. And, uh, and, I, and I love that situation. I love that premise uh, that th th this is all about uh, the mortality of Batman and how uh, Gotham is uh, this city that has been protected by a guy who is just a guy, and where are the superpowered superheroes in this universe where there are all these superpowered characters all over the place uh, to help the people of Gotham. And uh, that's where these um, strange-looking new superheroes uh, come on the cover who are just uh, briefly, quickly introduced at the end as a big cliffhanger, uh, which I feel like I can mention because they're there on the cover, and also this book is now two weeks old. Um, I, uh, I really liked uh, King's writing, dialogue writing especially in this quite a bit. I uh, had one of the most memorable Alfred lines I've read in a long time uh, where Batman's on that airplane and Alfred is, um, is helping him remotely and he says, uh, awaiting your stability, sir. And then he says, as always, I uh, love that. That's, that's a fantastic Alfred line. Um, always awaiting Bruce's stability. Um, at first, I was a little bit put off by this because it was, I was comparing it too much to Snyder. And it looks like Snyder because he's still got that, uh, that suit derived from when Jim Gordon was, was, ju was just Batman and all of that. It was, just, it was hard not to think about that stuff. And... It's another situ It's yet another situation where Batman's about to die and then he doesn't. But it's a better one and it works, and especially in a vacuum. I mean, if you haven't been this low, this this issue reads wonderful in a vacuum. Um, 
if you haven't... <laughs> I know, I liked it. <laughs> she's like, I read it inside a vacuum, too. <laughs> If you uh, haven't been reading Snyder at all, I think um, you might be even more taken with it than I was, um, just because you're not comparing it to that material. But um, but you know that situation is great because it's not um, it's not Batman uh, about to have to sacrifice himself because of escalation, because of a situation that he's kind of put himself into because of the horrible things that sometimes you can you can argue Batman has helped to create. It's just, there's going to be a plane crash. I mean, it's a hijacking thing, but it doesn't really have anything to do with the, the darkness or corruption or, or, uh, or you, know, you know, psychopathy that's in Gotham. And uh, that whole situation was really good. But yeah, I thought that was a wonderful issue. You read it too? Yep. Yeah, I've got it here somewhere. I mentioned <laughs> it, but... Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. But damn. Oh, okay. You got you you got a different cover. Did I? I wasn't really yes. paying attention to your cover. Um, did you <laughs> read Han Solo? I did. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I talked a little bit about it. I mentioned. Oh, I'm that sorry, it was, but the, I was I had to go back and check something. I didn't. Mean it's to all good. It's all good. Something, but I had to no, check no, no, something. No, no, no. Yeah, no. I, I I read it. I um I thought it was intriguing at the very end because I'm interested in the whole like race plot but overall it was pretty bleh to me so I'll stick with it but just because I'm intrigued by the race part but the actual setup was less than stellar in my it's opinion been a few days. I remembered really enjoying it uh like like I, I kind of I guess the, the race situation by the end um I thought we'd live with that a little bit longer that was a thing but, yeah, like get an issue where they're actually on the race instead of just like the race starts and like explosions. <laughs> yeah, and then re and then really quickly we 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 kind of get away from that premise and go someplace else entirely. But um, I thought, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> I thought it was um it was a really exciting issue. I uh, like like once you got toward the end, I thought a lot of the action was a lot of fun, and um, I think I like this artwork, but um. But yeah, it's um, it's kind of what I would have expected from a Han Solo book, I guess. I mean, I don't have a whole lot to say about it until we get more of it. But yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and move on now to cover of the week, and um, feel free to pick from anything uh, from either of the previous weeks. I had not really thought about this. <laughs> yeah, I haven't either. Um, She's like, I hated everything. Ooh, okay, I know. I know what my cover of the week is, and it's not from this past week. It's from the week that we skipped. It's Scooby Apocalypse for sure. I'm just loving this art so much, and I love <laughs> the character design of them because they're like, I don't know, hipsters, I guess. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's, it's a very weird universe that they're building around this specific title of this sort of like dystopia, kind of like near future type of level of technology uh but then adding in this like hipster vibe and like this save the world vibe and it's interesting and i think the aesthetic of the art works really well and it's just there's a lot going on on that cover what about you uh my cover is gonna be carnage number nine because this book is lousy but has wonderful covers um look just just the the, the boat with Carnage's face, he's larger than life and a force of nature, and it has everything to do with what this book's about. Um, I mean, I should mention that that the the comparison between Brock and Cletus Cassidy and how they're both psychopaths, but one is pure evil and one is not, and like develop psychopathy. I guess that's interesting. It's not the bulk of the book or anything. That's not what we're exploring. But like, that's kind of that was kind of my one takeaway. Um, but these covers are wonderful. Like, I, I always I always want to I always want to take these and make them posters. Except then I would just be reminded by how disappointed I've been with this book. <laughs> okay, so uh, Red Lantern Tilly's got the uh, got the digital code for this week, and uh, Antilles, you feel free to ask for any of, I know you're not going to ask for Star Wars because you just mentioned that in the chat, so you've read that, uh, but feel free to ask for any of my Marvel books, and um, don't ask for that, it's just not that good. And uh, 
in the meantime, I will mention that uh, the thing he got he got right as far as uh, what I am most looking forward forward to uh, this coming week. Well, no surprise to anybody. Uh, Dark Knight number three, of course, uh, put that on my list because uh, the Kryptonian stuff has been fascinating. And that last issue was really riveting. Um, I gotta look at that whole thing together because I I'm reading so many books. I just keep forgetting what's happening in that month to month. But I remember loving that issue. <laughs> uh, Lo. What are I, I'll just mention mine uh, uh, three to one real quick, okay. um, and then and then and then we'll go over to yours. So uh, that is um, well, honestly, that would have been my number one, and then um, Spider Man number five because uh, the setup for the next issue was interesting, and I've been loving that book. And then I'm also going to mention I think I will probably buy this, and people will think I'm silly, but I, I don't care because uh, I like to give some love to the. Uh, to the kids' books, and uh, uh, DC has had a really good track record for kids' books. And weirdly enough, I kind of liked the uh, Free Comic Book Day issue setting up DC Superhero Girls. So I'm going to read that. I'm going to I'm going to get that volume and um, and uh, tell you what that's like. Uh, it's called Finals Crisis because they're in high school and they have to deal with finals. So um, I partly have to get that just for title alone. And it's a ten dollars trade, and I think it's cool for them to. Uh, to, to make it that inexpensive. Um, still surprised it's not coming out in issues and that it's coming out in, um, in, in uh, just uh, graphic novels. I kind of wonder how well it will sell that way to a, to a kid audience, but we'll see. Lo, what about you? My top three for next week are number three is Squirrel Girl number nine. I really don't need to tell you guys why I'm excited for that book because I'm excited for it the same reasons as always. Number two <laughs> is Silk number nine. Um, uh, I mentioned briefly that I really liked the Spider-Gwen issue following kind of the fallout, and I think Silk is in the most interesting place after Spider-Woman. Um, yeah. yeah. uh, so I'm really, really excited for what's going on in her world, because, man, everything is just topsy-turvy for that poor girl. And number one is Plutona number five. Um, it's been delayed for a while, and it's the fifth in a mini-series of five, so this is the the last issue, um, if you guys haven't heard of that book, it's about a bunch of kids that discover kind of their local, like, famous superhero in their world dead in the woods and how they deal with that knowledge. And uh, it's sort of like Stand By Me meets superheroes. Like, it's like about <laughs> a bunch of kids in the woods kind of, like, doing their thing in this, like, summer adventure, but there's also, like, serious stuff going on. So those sort of, like, clashing ideals. Um, it's been a really fun book. I'm excited to read the last issue. Uh, awesome. There we go. So those are our anticipated books, and uh, we did cover the week. So now it's time to move on finally to our open forum for the evening. Uh, well, we timed that out really well. We got about 10 minutes left in the program. Woo! So feel free to start asking your questions. Uh, open forum, ask us anything uh, about comics and superhero stuff, and uh, feel free to uh, take us in any direction you want to within reason. And let's see if any interesting things... Already... I have a question for you, Cap. So oh, man. What's your question, being, being that I am just, in fact, I was going to mention it last week because it was actually the week of my one year since I bought I'm sorry my for ruining comic. that for you. We should have had a cake right? and everything. We should have had a cake. And... But, so now I'm at one year and a week since I bought my first comic. And since I'm at a year, I can start to look at a certain type of book that I just sort of ignored. Did you just spill your soda? <laughs> Uh, I think it's okay, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's empty enough that nothing came out. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, I've been sort of ignoring annuals, partly because they sounded like something that I wouldn't be able to get into because they are like a year's worth of something. What What are annuals? Because there's a spider going annual coming out this week, and I, that's like the last type of comic book that I don't really understand. Like, what makes them different than a trade versus, yeah, Teach me your ways, Cap. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So um, annuals are handled in any myriad number of ways, but generally what they are is uh, another way for uh, comic companies to milk you out of uh, one more book for the year. So it basically, you got 13 issues and that one, or, or however often it comes out, and that one's kind of a one-shot fill-in. 
Um, a, a lot of the time, that's how it's handled, uh, where it's kind of maybe an interlude issue. Um, it usually isn't part of the sequence, where like it's the next thing that happens and you have to have read it. It's usually kind of a one-shot thing. Alternatively, what happens a lot is you'll have uh, kind of mini events that will happen between annuals. So, um, you know, we just had the Spider-Woman event that went between different uh, books. Often what will happen is you'll have a four or six part event that goes through all the annuals. Okay, so they so it's not a collection of stories like... Almost never. Yeah. Okay. It's usually so it's, just a it's very different than a trade paperback or like a hardcover. Oh yeah, you know, it's just like, a single totally issue. And, and, and very often, and very often, they're not any bigger. Uh, it's just another issue, um, and they're numbered, uh, and, and they have their own separate numbering. Um, they are technically treated as if they're their own series, but they're not. But so it'll be I'm like of, <laughs> it'll be of that volume, uh, uh, and it's still in whatever status quo you're in usually. Um, but uh, you know, if you go back to and these have been around forever. Um, you know, you go back to like Amazing Spider-Man. It had some thirty something annuals. Um, Weird. That's yeah, completely because, like I, I said, since it had the word annual in it, I was just like. I just completely ignored them. I was like, I don't know what these are. I'm so new to comics. I'm just going to focus on single issues for right now. Um, and and I had a completely it? different idea of what annuals were in my mind. Yeah, and like I said, they're almost never oversized. They're they're they're, they're almost they're almost never even extra page counts. Um, what I uh, sometimes they are, but um, what's weird is some comic shops won't put them in your pull box even if you pull that that uh, that series because. It's like it's kind of part of it, but it's technically not, and um, so you'll have to pull it separately sometimes. Uh, but it just depends on your shop. Oh, my comic shop will pull if I put down like Spider Gwen, and that's all I put. Like he'll just pull everything, and then be like, "Just take out whatever you don't want," <laughs> yeah. which is part of how I ended up with so many books because I would just be like, "Oh, that's interesting. I'll just keep it." I mean, it's a brilliant sales technique, if anything. <laughs> It absolutely, and um, and it, it's also, it also means you just have a really cool comic shop owner because some people get really anal about that, and if you you know pull things and they have to put it back on the shelf, they'll give you a lot of guff for that. And sometimes if it happens too often, they won't even let you pull anymore because that's extra books. Um, but if they know how to order, they 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 know how to they know how to deal with that where you can occasionally pull a thing that that is extra that they have to put on their shelf and eat and they still do fine with their business so um but also this we, there's an entire section about this in my in my comic shop documentary um but i uh, if um but it also depends on the size of the store if you're a really super small store that's harder to get away i'm seeing with. a couple people in the comments acting or asking, oh, oh, no, it looks like one person asked and then one person answered. But just in case people are wondering, are annuals collected in trade? And according to Brendan, uh, yes, they are collected into trade. So then you would have like Batman annual trade paperback. I'm not one. sure. I mean, it just depends <laughs> on how it factors into other stories. Like more, like like if you had again, if you had an event that was collecting annuals, then that event would be collected. Okay. Is, is the thing. Um, yeah, I think comics they, make no sense, Cap. I don't know if you're aware of this. <laughs> um, they don't. No, they don't. They don't. I've spent, I've spent my whole life it. trying to make sense out of the whole thing low. Um, see, that's the thing is, is uh, if you if you pretend to be like I, like I'm not an expert in comics, but if you pretend to be like an aficionado, you you sort you, you sort of kind of know a thing, or you pretend to be an expert in, in, in something where there actually is no rhyme or reason. Um, like like that's like the that's a really cushy place to be in, you know, where you're like, I know this really well. The secret is there's no right answer. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, people are asking about next uh, Superhero Rewind. I'm sorry that's not out yet. Uh, these are Future Past. I am working on as we speak, not like right now. That, that's why I've been so distracted. I've been writing that review the whole time we've been talking. No, um, that <laughs> is, uh, I'm working on that, and uh, it should be out this week, hopefully. Uh, somebody asked about Canon Crypto Freaks. I'll be working on the next one of those as soon as I'm done with Days of Future Past. Uh, the last few superhero rewinds have just been behemoths. They've just been really big scripts and a lot to talk about. And um, I can either force myself to write a lot less and keep them to six or eight pages, or I can say everything I want to say and take a little longer on them, or sometimes take a lot longer on them. Sorry about that. Uh, but I keep... I keep opting to um, do them the way I want to rather than rushing them out. Um, 
Cap, will you review Morrison's Batman on the Comic Vault? Yes. Steve and I, uh, we're talking about that again just today. We have been meaning to do that forever. And uh, I don't know. I don't know when exactly that's going to happen. I, I don't want to promise it soon because there's just so much other stuff going on right now. Um, just started that new series with Eric going through Babylon 5 and Deep Space Nine because uh, I'm meaning to go through Bab 5 for the better part of a decade. And uh, we're we're doing we're doing that. So you know, I don't want to be like like Barry Allen and stretch myself too thin, but we will try to do that uh, at some point. But that is a thing that I need to prioritize because Morrison keeps coming up, and I don't know it as well as I should. Uh, what else? Steve, uh, uh, Steve, I'm sorry. I talked to Steve for three hours earlier. Uh, Lo, if you see, if you see cool things, yeah, Lo, I'm sorry. Lo, you just, you look like Steve. I'm sorry. We, we get that a lot. <laughs> you guys are, you're like twins. <laughs> it's uncanny. Uh, Lo, you should see me when I grow a beard. Then it's like, you can't even you tell us apart. Difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lo, uh, somebody wants to know, Critic Corner wants to know, grape or strawberry jelly? Uh, grape flavored stuff is disgusting. I so, like grape yeah, yeah I stuff. like grapes, like actual grapes, but grape flavored <laughs> stuff is gross. So, strawberry. <laughs> uh, people are bringing back the cake reviews hashtag. Yes. You remember cake reviews? Oh, I remember. I think I joined in on that a little bit ago. <laughs> <laughs> It's because it's because you mentioned we should have had a cake last week for my one year since I started reading comics. Yes, Ultron Thirty Two. I am looking forward to the Big Hero Six animated series. I think it's going to be awesome. Why didn't know like, that was happening? That's awesome. We're, we're yeah, it'll be on so the Disney Channel. No mention if we would ever get a sequel to that. So I'm glad. Yeah, that would make for a wonderful weekly show. That's yeah, good. yeah, I'm excited for it. No, that is exciting. Cool. One of us may have to try to cover that on the channel. It's a good movie. Uh, Soundwave wants to know if Lo has read Superior Foes of Spider-Man. I doubt it, but nope. you should. I'm still, I'm still uh, like, uh, as you guys have like surmised from this show and especially this specific week, I'm still like getting to know just like terminology and like how things work with comics. Um, so I need to start going back and actually reading some of the classic stuff. I have a an entire Google Doc that's just like all these different like older comics and classic stuff that I need to read and I need to start getting in on that. But there's so many new stuff to read too. Time. I need more time. Yeah. Uh, that is a really quirky, super jokey comic about a bad guy team uh, going and stealing stuff and getting into silly hijinks and you would absolutely love it. And shocker. In that right book, up my alley. <laughs> yeah. Right, right up your alley. Uh, it's adorable. So adorable. Hashtag even. <laughs> Hashtag adorable. Hashtag adorable. Hashtag um, let's see. Uh, there was something else I wanted to tackle. Uh, somebody want, wanted to know... Oh, Barry Allen. Uh, oh, by the way, um, hi, Barry Allen. Uh, he's He's been a uh, follower of ours for a long time, and uh, Lo talks to him on Twitter all the time. And uh, he this is his first live show, so uh, welcome. So cool that you finally got to make it to one of our live shows. Um, he wants to know when we're going to the Power Rangers convention. That is the weekend of my birthday, uh, August 12th. And uh, that is going to be such a busy month for me, Lo. I can't believe how much stuff I'm doing that month. Uh, the, a couple days before that, uh, I told I told you about this uh, the yeah. other day, but um, a couple days before that, I am going to for the very first time finally get to see Batman '89 on the big screen. I'm so I'm so stoked about that. Uh, <laughs> I probably saw it on the big screen when I was five. Uh, I don't remember if my parents told me they actually took me to that or not, um, or if they thought it was too dark for me. But then I watched it on video immediately after. Um, but uh, I finally. Like, like to my recollection, it will be the first time I finally get, get to see it on the big screen, which I'm really excited about. So that's gonna be cool. And uh, then the week before that, uh, I'm taking Jason to the Weird Al concert. Uh, I haven't, I haven't been to Weird Al since uh, oh three. Um, I love Weird Al. And finally I gonna get to see him again. Yeah, he's one of my big. He's one of my people who want to like, st I actually don't know what channel this video is posted to, but I have a really funny story of when I was like a youngin. It's either on the Curious Low or it's on Bookfish to Movie Bird, which is my vlog channel, if you care to follow that. But I have a story of me going to my first Weird Al concert 
it's a very fond memory for me. I love Weird Al so much. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Cool. Well, uh, you and I, I mean, I already knew this, but we're going to get along really well uh, <laughs> when, I, when I get in and see you. Yeah, Weird Al is one of my favorite things. Um, I think that's going to be it for us tonight, folks. Thanks so very much for watching New Comic Late Night. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for coming live. Thanks for watching it after the fact if you did that. And we'll be right back on track next Monday night at midnight with uh, our books from this coming week. I am Captain Logan. And I'm the Curious Love. We'll see you next week. Thanks again.